Hello, all you lovely people, and welcome to a new year of passion projects filled with fun and engaging conversations from those who've been able to turn their passions into their full-time jobs or kept them as their side hustle. On the first episode of 2019, I talked to a popular sports personality in Canada who hosts his own series titled Cabby Presents, the one and only Cabral Richards, or as many of you know him as Cabby. We reminisce about those good old score days and so much more. Take a listen. Cabby, thank you so much for joining us here on episode five of Passion Project. How are you today? I'm I'm doing okay. I'm uh, I'm a little under the weather, but I'm happy to be having this conversation with you. I'll make sure that my energy is appropriate for the topics that we discuss. Awesome. And no worries. I hope you feel better. And I just got to say, though, I definitely do miss Toronto and its weather, even though it must be super cold outside compared to the sunshine I'm seeing through my window right now. Oh, yeah. We're definitely taking an L when it comes to weather, for sure. You are, you are, winning, you, you are winning that category by, like, 150,000 points. Um, I know, right? Very true. I wanted to actually sit down and have this talk with you about your passion. Um, so I grew up uh, watching you and watching everything that you've done uh, from the score to now your days at TSN, and um, I really looked up to you, and I wanted to be, quote, unquote, the girl version of Cabby. So I wanted to really emulate the way in which you kind of went about doing what you were doing on, on your sports segments. But I want to know where your passion kind of stemmed from, well, first of all, if you were the female version of me, you would have been way more ch- charming, more intelligent, and had actual <laughs> information to deliver to the audience. I'm just a knucklehead that does that has these silly antics and invades the personal space of athletes and entertainers. So I'm just basically an adult donkey, um, just <laughs> with, with a platform to do really ridiculous things. Um, and the passion... I guess when I was younger, I always wanted to entertain, and I'm very, very fortunate that I found a way to do that, even though I'm super annoying to people. Uh, so it's um, this, is just, this lane where I'm just interviewing people, is just, I just kind of carved it out. And although, like, a reporter is not an original enterprise, I suppose my sort of twist on the game, making it more lighthearted, really trying to amplify the personalities of the people I speak to, um, that the, the only thing that I saw when I was younger was Inside Stuff, NBA Inside Stuff, which was hosted by Ahmad Rashad, and he got to interview, like, the biggest um, NBA players, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, um, but he wasn't really doing super light but it's stuff. That the, I think the tone and the theme of the show was more focused towards kids with the graphics and all that kind of stuff, but, um, but I didn't, yeah, I, there, I guess there wasn't really – it wasn't really someone like me in sports. So um, it wasn't a direct file. Like, I, I, I don't know. I, I started as kind of just doing, like, this man-on-the-street thing where I would go and yeah. harass, you know, students on university campuses or college campuses, and then mm-hmm. people, like, you know, on the subway, just asking them dumb sports questions. And, um, and it just kind of grew from there. Uh, and, I, and I really – that was, like, my creative outlet. So then once – I decided, okay, this is the thing that you're going to do. Then I put all my energy towards it. I hope that answers your question. I kind of no, made it a little bit there. <laughs> no, definitely. Um, I was going to say, though, when you first began doing, like, the streeters, were you – was it intimidating? Were you just like, whatever, I'm just going to go out there and, like, whatever happens, happens kind of thing? No, no, no. Yeah, it was intimidating. I dealt with a lot of rejection. So it was very much like uh, – symbolic of my actual life. <laughs> There's a, you know, you're just approaching, like, strangers and just asking them for a bit of their time. And here, you know, to the strangest point of view, here's this large, chubby black guy with a clipboard coming up to them with this big, doughy, stupid smile. <laughs> and, you know, some people, like, I, I think one out of every ten person would say yes, they would agree to, to answer these questions. So on any given day, I'm getting rejected by like 60 people. You know what I mean? So uh, it kind of it kind of built that armor a little bit uh, for me. Um, but so yeah, so it was it was a little bit intimidating, but I didn't let it kill my spirit because I'm like I just need 
you know, two more clips or two more people have to round this story out, whatever dumb question I was asking about a mascot or about, you know, some pregame routine or what they eat at the stadium, you know, dumb things like that. That was how I felt, too. I remember when I was in school doing the same sort of thing. It was intimidating, but it became something like you develop a thick skin for it, for sure. Music has been really instrumental in your upbringing, um, and your parents used to play that a lot around your house. So how did your parents kind of shape your career path or help you mold yourself in terms of the whole broadcast side of things? It was the work ethic. Like, my parents are immigrants, so – and, I'm, you know, I'm sure you can understand as well, like, you, yeah. want, you know, they want a better life for the kids. So it's just work ethic. My mom was a tyrant about school and then also about having a part-time job. I get, I think mostly just to keep me out of trouble, but also just so I could buy things for myself. So my first job was when I was 14. I worked at Wednesday. Actually, no, I had a paper route at 10. I was delivering the Toronto Sun on Sundays. I'd get up at, like, 5.30 in the morning and I'd be done by, like, 6.30 or 7. I think I had, like, 80 houses. I'm out there with a, wheeling around a little red cart that was always um, preached in the household. It's like work ethic, work ethic. So then, so that's definitely in my DNA uh, from all those, you know, the, the times that I didn't have a job, I just, like, you'd wake up on Saturday, you know your doors, vacuum, clean the bathroom. And sometimes I just didn't want to hear my mom. <laughs> just, it actually motivated me to get a job when I didn't have one. So just so I wouldn't hear my mom, like, screaming, you know, first thing in the morning, get up, where's the bathroom? And I just want to watch cartoons. I just want to watch cartoons, and I just want to watch, you know, Saturday, whatever that was on Saturday morning, I think, like, wrestling, video games. Like, once video games came into my life, that's just all I wanted to play. But uh, thankfully, due to my mom and my dad's urging to not be a lazy bastard, I was able to <laughs> develop some kind of work ethic. No, that's awesome. Video games. Were you a big video gamer? See, you know what? Uh, to answer your question, yes. And that's really – video games was like my entry point into sports. I was a mar- like a marginal athlete at best. And I didn't ha- – like my – I didn't – so I played baseball in high school. I played football. Um, but, like, when I was, you know, 8, 9, 10 – I'm not that I was playing video games that early, but – um, I was just playing, like, organized sports. But when the EA sports titles came out, so that's Madden, that's NHL, that's NBA Live, that was, that was really how I got to learn the players and learn how to play some of the games. And then I watched it on TV, but I watched it with a little better understanding, certainly with, like, Madden football. Like, you're looking at the defense, it's nickel package, you know, goal line, and the, you, know, um, uh, you know, base, 14 base. That, that's it – it is so odd. I'm not sure if other people – that was really their their entry point into sports, but video games definitely helped me. And that, and then then I got into like fantasy sports, and then that certainly took my my fandom to another level. I remember hearing and trying myself too that um, for me to really understand football, playing Madden was like one of the best things that you could do. Yes, I'm with you. And like, and then you play with your boys or your, your friends or whatnot, and. You know, I, I I stopped being a gamer because I would get so frustrated, Pyle. Like, I would yeah. be, I was that guy that would, like, turn off. Like, if I'm down, like, three touchdowns, I would turn off the game. Like, I, or just reset it. And my friends would be like, yo, you can't do that, man. I was the, like, the, the, the prototypical worst, like, gamer. Like, just that worst temper. I was the worst person to play with. I would do the same thing. I would be like, no, I'm, I'm, if I was playing against my brother, I'm like, he's not winning. You're, you're not winning. You're cheating. I like, I like that we have these things in common. It's like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know. You're, you're also a sore loser just like me is what we're, what yeah. we're discovering here when it comes Pretty to Pretty much, business. exactly. <laughs> Kathy, who were your favorite TV personalities growing up? That's a great question. I guess Ahmad Rashad. Um, yeah. Whew. I like oh, these guys are actors, but I like you know I'm I'm of a certain age, so I like Saved by the Bell. Like I like AC Slater because he was like strong and some of that <laughs> team, and he competed with Zach Morris for like I think he had the better. No, no I guess Zach, Zach Morris had the better lines from Saved by the Bell, but I like the yeah. show. people who are actually on TV. Um, there was a guy who was on BET when I was in university, 
His name his name is Al Shearer, but on the show he did a he did a segment called Hits from the Street, and he would go to like college campuses and he would in, do street mm-hmm. as well. But his style was more he would like make fun of people, and um and he was funny doing it. I wouldn't. So that informed a bit of me doing my street or stuff, but I wouldn't make fun of people. I'd prefer to make fun of myself because I just thought it would be – it's just more enjoyable for the audience. And also, right. like, I just want, want to be picking on total strangers. Like, I'm asking them for the time, and then I'm just going to rip what they're wearing or whatever, what they say, if they didn't have the correct answer to one of my dumb trivia questions. So those two guys, those two guys were uh, people that I enjoyed watching when I was uh, – before I started working in television. Is that what inspired you in terms of doing the caddy on the street aspect of things? Uh, there was probably, yeah, there was probably some of that. I, I would say so. Um, maybe subconsciously, not like, uh, oh, I want to do that. It was just like I saw him out there, you know, entertaining people, and then I, I probably said to myself, yeah, that that looks kind of fun. And and also I had big time help with um from Lisa Bowes and Steve Coolius when I was at the floor, who were weekend anchors of their highlight show, and they urged me to to go out and, like, to do, like, a streeter segment, mostly just to get me out of the office because I just used to talk incessantly and, like, people couldn't shut me up because I was, I was the enemy of silence. So with a push from them, that, that certainly helped me get, uh, get my start. No, that's amazing. Um, the score days, I miss them. They were good days. I miss them too. I, you know, I often talk when, when Tim McCallum and I speak where we often, or we've said it many times that we'll never get a work environment like that again and we'll never have like a workplace like that again because there were, you know, for people who, who don't really understand the score or who just didn't work there, there were like, I don't know, a hundred people, maybe 120 people that were all between the ages of 20 and 30. And it was pretty much our first real job, like our first, like, salary job. M- most of the people that started as interns, if they were, and then became producers or on air, and then the editors came from, like, a, a specific school, and it was just, you know, it was such a little family, and plus, we were, like, the yeah. smallest of the sports world. There was, there was a huge chip on our shoulders, and also, it, it enabled us to try a bunch of different things that TSN or Sportsnet wouldn't try as far as the content goes you know, court surfing, the way that we cut our highlights, you know, the, the music that we use, you know, some of the fantasy stuff, um, being the first to market with that. I think, I think Steve Cooley is, or he'll tell you that he invented ice surfing. <laughs> just, we, would just, we would just bounce around to, to different hockey games in progress, and that, and that stopped when I think, um, I think the NHL Network – was first first opened its doors, and then the NHL was like, "Yeah, you guys can't do that, and we gotta we gotta put that product over here." Or TSN at the time, I think they complained or something, so we had to stop doing it. We couldn't. Yeah, and so the the surfing idea went from ice, like ice surfing, to diamond surfing and baseball. And Ryan Payton would do that for the sum. You know, that's that's all we had to show, and then it went into court surfing. So anyway, I'm, I'm meandering a bit, but the, the the main thing is there were so many young people there. Everybody was really competitive because they wanted to put out like the hottest videos or, or the funniest videos. So A we're young, B competitive, and C we're just like a small little family, and and that really made um, made our work environment so enjoyable. Do you still get a chance to keep in touch with Tim and Sid and Adnan? Yes, I, I speak to Tim and and Donovan Bennett the most. Right. Um, and Adnan and I probably text once a week, and it's it's either some movie stuff or he appears on the Levitard show, which is in Miami, and he's yes. kind of like um, he he has this he has, he's like this character in this world reaches the gate and gets on the show, and Dan Levitard's like, how did he get on the show? How did he get past security? And he he'll come in and you'll have these like these you know, 25-second high-polluting movie reviews. <laughs> anyway, so we think about that. And, and obviously, like, Adnan Burke, we went to Ryerson together, um, and he is the most talented of our whole crew. We had this crew at school. We called ourselves the Hard Eight. And we were, like, again, just, like, eight dudes, super competitive. 
and we won a bunch of awards at Ryerson in our radio and TV program, and we were like the cockiest <laughs> SOBs in school. And then, but from that group, there were like two of the most brilliant comedic minds. Uh, my friend Randall Thor, RT, is he's doing um, TV shows for Blind Spot on NBC. He just he just got funding to do a feature film. My friend Houston mm-hmm. Abji is an actor. He's in LA. I'm a donkey. And then my boy, and then Adnan is, like, he's crushing it at ESPN. That guy, he can literally get on any set for any event and then be able to host the broadcast and then throw to the play-by-play guys doing, you know, tennis, golf, college football, college basketball, baseball. The guy is, he's amazing. So, yes, we got Tim, Donovan, Adnan. I don't see Sid as much. Um, yeah. and, I, and I speak of my producer, uh, my man, D, Dave Chris, every day. We talk on the phone every day. Yeah, and, and we work together at TSN, so that's why we No, that's amazing. I was going to tell you, too, um, I actually am going to be speaking with Adnan next week on the show, so that's very Oh, awesome. Exciting. Awesome, yeah. awesome. He's, he's got his, his – now, his passion project is um, – he's doing it. Podcast, Cinephile. Like, when, yeah. we were, when we were at school, the first – um, in our first year, I thought I was a movie guy until I met Burke. And then I became competitive because Burke, I think the summer before we were in our first year at Ryerson, he watched like 100 or 120 movies. And he would, we had this uh, video store uh, we called uh, Rogers. You know, while I was, you know, you know, in the summer playing baseball and I had a job at Canadian Tires trying to save some money to go to school, blowing it all. Like, just being a total idiot. This dude was just crushing movies. And he had this vocabulary about films that none of us had. And I was like, oh, I need to get on that level. So you, you can ask him about it. I'm sure, I don't, and I don't know what, like, why movies became his thing, but he yeah. was just the aficionado of the crew. And he's probably going to talk about Scorsese and, and uh, 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 well, Scorsese's most. And that, who, who, who directed, oh, uh, who directed The Godfather again? Why am I having a brain freeze? Um, um. Francis Ford Coppola. You might even still yes. want to see Francis Ford Coppola for you. It's awesome that you're talking to Bert next week. Yeah, his, his, um, his son, isn't his middle name Scorsese or something yes. like that? His, <laughs> yeah, his first, um, his first son, is, I think it's Yusuf. Yusuf, yeah. I think, is his oldest son. His middle name is Scorsese. I think, like, his next son, he's got four sons. Like, this dude, I, I, heard, I read this joke today about Philip Rivers, like, the only thing he's afraid of is birth control, because Philip Rivers has, like, nine or ten kids. Like, Burke yeah. is in the – Burke might approach that conversation at some point, because he's got four sons. And I believe um, one of his sons either has Pacino as a middle name, and the other son has De Niro as a middle name. On the certificate in either the state of California or the state of, uh, of Connecticut, They're, those are on the government documents. That's amazing. I can't wait to talk to Burke about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's quite, it's, it's very much Burke. Anyway, sorry. I was going to say, no, speaking of um, Jumbo Video, while Burke was, like, incessantly watching all these videos, I was literally spoiling my dinner because I would be going to Jumbo Video with popcorn because it was so salty good. Yes. <laughs> through the VHS tape. Yes, and it was free. We would, sometimes it we would go free. to, we would, that was our preferred video store just because of the, the salty popcorn. And we never considered when we were in high school how many people stuck their friggin' hands in that popcorn maker, <laughs> that popcorn container. But we just went because it's free and get multiple bags before we left. Just, we were just little punks. No, since I would do the same thing. My mom, as we would come home, she would be so upset at us because, like, we were not going to eat dinner after that. It was not a, it's not a good picture. It's not a pretty picture. I'm right there with you. And I digress. I guess the day and age in which we are now, um, and as we all grow older, how do you find that you continue to relate to players that are between the ages of 18 to 25, I would say? That's a fair question. Um, the connecting point, I, see, I, I want to make them relatable to the audience. Right. And even though the widening age gap, as I continue to get older, there are things that connect us all, the things that we all um, use in our daily lives. And, you know, these guys aren't that much different than I am. Age, yes, and certainly lifestyle. They can afford a lifestyle that I cannot. 
but in order for me to make them relatable to the audience, I have to basically bring them into the audience's world. So a lot of times I'll talk about phones. I'll talk about stuff in high school. Cause those are relatable experiences. I interviewed Wayne Gretzky once, and I was stressed out about it because I'm like, what am I going to ask Wayne Gretzky, who is probably the greatest Canadian athlete ever? He's certainly the most celebrated and the greatest hockey player of all time. So I started the interview asking him about his phone, about his cell phone. I was like, Wayne, when you um, respond to people on your phone, are you a ha-ha-ha guy or an LOL guy? He laughed. His kid, Trevor, was there. I was doing this Q&A, and he's like, uh, I don't know, Trevor, what do I do? I, I, and I, and I, I'm not sure if he, if he said either one. And then I asked him about emojis, like, what emoji do you use most often? This is probably two or three years ago when people were using emojis a lot. I don't think they use emojis quite as much anymore, but he goes, I don't even know what an emoji is. And then I think his son, who Trevor, was like, no, you, you use this one, I think he said, or something like that. So immediately... 12 or someone who's 22 or someone who's 60, maybe not 62, but who's, they 12 or 22 can relate to the phone because that's what every, everybody has a phone. And then um, that's how I tried to make Wayne Gretzky on this pedestal for most of Canada relatable to someone who's just watching this for the, who, who doesn't have that same reverence for Wayne Gretzky or doesn't have the same access to Wayne Gretzky. They get, so they're like, oh, yeah, wow, I, I use, I use, I'm a ha-ha-ha guy. I'm not an LOL mm-hmm. guy. So they had that connecting point. And, and do you find it then um, difficult or do you find it um, easy to kind of keep up with the different trends and the cultural changes um, as, as, the time, as time progresses and, I guess, as, the, as things change? I don't find it difficult because I'm into it. Like I, I like right. – I read, I read Fast Company – I watch, you know, when I'm on YouTube, I go on lives on Vox. Um, I, you know, I, I read Medium. Like, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm immersed in pop culture, and I also like, you know, I like social media. It, it, you know, even though it's poisonous and even though there's a lot of hate speech on there, I, I, that's how I get my information. I get it from Twitter, and I like my candy on Instagram. And I, I get some information on Instagram, less so than, than Twitter, but... I'm still really into those formats. Um, so I don't, it's challenging. And I, you know, I was watching something on The Economist yesterday about like trends in 2019. So I like to be, I like to be up with the, on current events so that I can reference them just in, even in regular conversation, just to be aware of it yeah. in the world, the marketplace, et cetera. Right, right. Um, I'm very curious to know, what is the thought process that um, you guys do in terms of, behind the segments that you create, because they're awesome. And I absolutely oh, you. You. love them. Uh, I, like, get excited to watch Caddy Presents and what you're going to come up with next. And I, I absolutely love that. And I'm just I'm curious to know, yeah, what the thought process is behind how you guys kind of create amazing segments. You're very kind. Are you sure? Wait, did you go out last night? Like, are you still – are there still some – Remnants from last night, like some wine or some going on in your room. Like, wait, did you have a night like I did last night? Because uh, you're, you're, you're very Maybe. kind. Um, not uncharacteristically kind, but just very kind. Uh, you know, the, the things that so, – so that part is challenging. It's like coming up with a new series of questions or a new idea or some bit for athletes is tough. I always – I consider what haven't they done before – what are they willing to do, and what can I get away with at TSN? So those are always coming up with new things every week is tough. And, you know, I always – I envy, you know, Fallon, Kimmel, Kimmel. You know, Fallon is the king of games. You know, Kimmel is the king of pranks. Corden, like James Corden, sort of does everything. And then Conan, he has, like, the sharpest wit. And he also has, like, awesome, like, performance pieces. Whenever Will Ferrell's on, you're going to get a different character. You're going to get, like, something bizarre. Um, so, like, I aspire to have to create that kind of content, but we're just a two-man shop, like Dave Crix and I. So just our two brains <laughs> try to come up with um, fun things to do. And uh, sometimes we're successful. A, a lot of times, you know, we're not, but... Um, that's part of it, which is which is fun. So, you know, I'll I'll go on YouTube. I'll read, 
you know, I'll, I'll, when I want, like, stats, stat stuff, like, I'll go on the athletics. But when I just want to look for, like, fun, conversational things, sometimes I watch Sean Evans, that show where they eat yes. 10 chicken wings. with ten, I mean, it's awesome. It's a simple concept, brilliant so execution. Good. I, that, that, that I'm professionally jealous of that segment. So I'll watch, and he's actually a pretty good interview. They have, sometimes I'll watch that for ideas, but other times I won't watch them. Like, oh, the, you know, he asked this. I'm like, I can never do that. So it's it's a bit of a, it's a, there's some good and some bad. But I'll, I'll find things online that I'll, I'll borrow, but inspired from articles or, or videos or what have you, and then I'll play. I'm like, oh, maybe you can change that, or oh, this would be a fun thing to ask about their high school experience and that sort of thing. Right. And I hope I answered the question. No, for sure. It did. It did. Um, and then from there, like, are there times, I, I know I was listening to your previous podcast as well in terms of um, writer's block. Are there different mechanisms that you use to help you comp- overcome writer's block? If there oh, is? that's uh, – I struggle so much with that pile. Like, so one thing I try to do is I'll go to the gym and I'll just run or – work out, and that clears my mind. I love it. Other times I'll just have to go for a walk just to get out of my house, just to be in a different environment. Sometimes I'll go to the library, and I'll try to brainstorm there with just, like, old school, like, pad of paper, like, my, an idea book, and I'll be sketching or I'll just be thinking of things. Sometimes I'll read, like, The Atlantic or I'll read Esquire or I'll read... Um, GQ and something, I don't know, something fashion would jump out of me or some story about some political issue or, I don't know, just reading. I'm try, trying to find things outside of sports that I could bring into sports or spark an idea. So those are kind of the things I, I try to use. I haven't had, like, a great, like, breakthrough in a while where, like, oh, this would be sick. Those are, <laughs> those are, are tough to come with, uh, to come up with. And I'm always searching for the next great bit. Like when Jimmy Kimmel tells his audience, tell your kid you ate their Halloween candy and record the reactions, I'm like, that is amazing. Mm-hmm. And then we get, like the other day he had a turn off Fortnite, like turn off the TV while your kid's playing Fortnite. And the reactions were priceless. Like it was what you thought it would be. Those, are, those little simple ideas, which have like a huge payoff, those I'm searching for those, but those don't happen quite as often. And, you know, what I end up editing, um, I, I, I thank you for the compliment. Sometimes I'll, I'll dress it up a little bit just to hide the fact that I may not have such a great idea. <laughs> so I get my graphics and I, I'm kind of taking you behind the curtain a little bit. There are instances where a player will be all for, uh, you know, speaking to you and, and the interview. And then there's sometimes where it's a challenge to really hold the player's attention. How do you go about those both sort of scenarios. Yeah, it's a tough one to navigate. Certainly, like, when I have a breakthrough from the writer's block, I'm like, oh, this could be cool. And then in the moment, if the player's not into it, it's, it, 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 it crushes you a little bit. But you just kind of have to soldier on. So the other day I interviewed Clay Thompson. And I've had really good interviews with Clay. He's generally pretty playful. And he's, he's a guy who, in all, like, Every NBA circle is like the best teammate because he's so low, so low maintenance and he's fine and he's kind of aloof, like he's in his own little world. So play, like playfully, he's got these characters in his world, like China Clay, there was headband Clay the other day when he got, he cut his head open, uh, bumping mm-hmm. into a teammate and then he dropped like 14 or 15 three pointers to set an NBA record in one game. Um, so I was like, okay, let me add to this world of, Characters. So, like, all right, we got this Photoshop. We did this Photoshop of okay, karaoke clay, uh, his head on, on Freddie Mercury, and then uh, karate clay. So I just found this, this some, some dude doing martial arts, and I put his head on the martial arts body and like, okay, karate clay. But on the day, the Golden State Warriors had flown from Oakland to Toronto. They, they had practiced from 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Eastern. So it's 6.30 p.m. on their body clock. And the guys just wanted, like, nobody was really that interested in doing interviews afterwards. And Clay definitely was not. And his vibe, just watching him, like, oh, man, this guy doesn't want to do it. And we had been warned, not warned, but reminded by the PR guy for the Golden State Warriors that, hey, this is going to be a five-minute interview. So I had to work, like, twice as hard to get, and Clay, like, 
as he was walking over to start the interview, he was like, and he's like, all right, man, I got two minutes. Like, said that out loud. I was like, oh, man, this is going to be tough. Because I have five, but he, in his mind, is resigned to two minutes. So I knew it was going to be a battle to, win, to kind of win him over and then to, to get him to a point where he was enjoying the interview. So in that particular piece, I had to dress it up a lot. I had to put a lot of, like, highlights in there, a lot of graphics. Some moments where he was, like, smiling and it seemed like he was enjoying himself, but there weren't a lot of them. So I had to add other elements just to kind of mask the fact that he just wanted to go eat. And which, you know, listen, you fly across the country land and then you have to practice for 90 minutes, like, the last thing you want to do is just talk to some goofball from Canada. So I can't really blame him. But that happens because these guys are just human beings. Yeah. And on any given day, someone could be in a great mood or there could be some, something going on in the person's life. A, a, a kid could be sick. Like, oh, my kid was vomiting all last night. I didn't have any sleep and I feel bad for my kid because I don't know what's going on. Like, the, all that could be going on in a person's mind. But me as the reporter, I had no idea. And I, and I have, like, three or five minutes with someone. As you know, like, you, your window of opportunity, your window of interview is very, very short. So you have to get in everything that you can in that time, and then hopefully they enjoy themselves. And when they don't, it's just a harder harder process to win them over yeah. and to get them to where, get their energy up to, to, to match what I, where, the energy that I bring in the interview. Definitely. I completely agree. Uh, and, I mean, that being said, who Wait, has it happened to you in your, in your, in your past life when you were interviewing NBA players where, so, where someone was like, just either really crusty or just wasn't into it, and you're like, you're trying your best to make it enjoyable. They just, it just wasn't a great experience? It, it, has, it definitely happened to me. And I've had these moments, too, where I feel like the players have, like, these side jokes with one another, and then they laugh at each other about something completely different from, I guess, what I'm talking about. But I always wonder about that, too, and I'm like, I wonder if they're laughing about me and, and like, am I saying something that they're just not a fan of or something like that? But yeah, it makes you feel self-conscious, right? Am I, yeah, am I the butt of the joke or is it something else? Yeah, I've, I've been there too. Yes, and I, I just I just try to continue on and just kind of finish out what I need to do and then kind of move on from there. Yeah, that, I've been there for sure. And who, who are your most favorite interviews of all time? All time, um, I'll give you one of each sport. Baseball, either Jose Batista or David Ortiz. Um, hockey, oh man, it's either it's either Ryan Getzlaff or Mike Richards or Jared. Hockey, there's a bunch, um, and then football is Aaron Rodgers, and then basketball is probably Kobe Bryant. All time. Right. Those are, like, my and, favorites. And then, but then there's, like, a random, like, Mike Tyson. Like, that guy, like, rubbed Vaseline on my face, like, while I was at his house. Like, that was an incredible yeah. moment for me. And then, like, I hugged Michael Jordan for an uncomfortable 10 full seconds. Mm-hmm. And he was trying to, like, pry fat body off of him by, like, elbowing me in the ribs. <laughs> but I was just holding on to this man. I'm like, is you Michael Jordan? And I'm just this creepy fat guy. And it's <laughs> so... I've had I've had some I've had some fun with, but those 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 four are a handful of players that those are the guys I've had like I've really enjoyed myself with. The Kobe Bryant segments have been one of my favorites too. I love them. I appreciate. I, I love them too. I, he he didn't love them, but I once a year where I'd make a trip to L.A. or I'd bug him when he was in Toronto. Yeah. No. It's, do you still talk to him from time to time, or not so much? No, I haven't yes. seen him in a while. We haven't, um, uh, we haven't seen in touch, which is by design. Like, Kobe likes to keep me at an arm's, not an arm's length, but a country length as, as far as distance goes. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see him as much. That's so funny. Kathy, would you say that, I guess, being in this industry, you have to have, you have to be a man or a woman of many traits in the sense of, um, knowing how to edit, produce, or just kind of yes. simple elements like that to be Yeah, able. oh, yes. You, you have to, like, be great. You know, we're, I don't know, I, su- I suppose, I, I get, uh, I'm going to reference Instagram again. 
such a visual, visual medium, and that's where so much of the audience lives within their daily lives. So if you can edit, if you know Photoshop, if you can, you know, produce, you know, all those, all those skills really helps. Like it's, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I suck at Photoshop. And I'm lucky that we have a team of ninjas at, at TSN that can realize my vision. And, like, I just did these, these custom skates for a hockey player, and I just saw them yesterday and showed them the things. Like, oh, those are pretty sick. And we're just talking about custom skates. But my point is, you're right, that, like, it is definitely an asset to be, to have multiple skills in, in media, you know, Photoshop, editing on Premiere or Final Cut, and... Yeah. You know, and be, or being just being a photographer, like that, that certainly helps too. We're in such a visual age, like so much of our information that we're consuming is visual versus the written word like it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Exactly. And um, I, I completely agree with you there too. I know I remember when I was going to school too with broadcasting, they would teach you um, how to use Final Cut, uh, what you needed to do in order to, um, I remember, you know how short I am and carrying this monster camera around. Oh right. My goodness. <laughs> Probably how my right. back started to suffer. The, so the much camera was as heavy as you. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, learning those traits is definitely, um, I feel, helped progress in my career path too. So I completely agree with you. I would give these upcoming broadcasters in the field who want to grow up and, you know, do what you do. Um, that's a good question. I, I generally say to work on writing because you, being clever will separate you from your peers. So um, whether someone has aspirations to be on the air or if they want to create videos and stuff, just having, just having a, like a point of view, whether you want to do like humorous content or if you want to do more analytical or pop culture based, just try to be clever in order to separate yourself. And then, you know, the skills that we mentioned, like Photoshop, uh, Final Cut, having those skills definitely helps too. Or, or, and learning how to shoot, you know, and learning how to tell stories, whether it's like, you know, uh, it could be a, a story about, you know, some high school per kid or it could be a story about the business of sports or whatever. Just And, 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 sorry, and last thing is just getting your reps in. I know I'm, this is, I'm like all over the place. My brain is like so – just being able to record as much as they can, work on applying their trade and just getting comfortable in front of the camera or just getting comfortable cutting stories, that will certainly help getting the reps in. And that's like, and, and that's like a simple sports analogy. Like you get your reps in the gym so that when you get on the field or on the court, you can perform. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, sorry, that was a cliche, and I hate cliches, and I just gave you one, and I'm so sorry. I appreciate you taking the time to do this podcast with me. I um, well, really appreciate it. No problem. Well, thank you for reaching out, uh, and it was nice to bump me. Where do we run into each other? Minnesota or something? Where, where were we? NBA Finals. Oh, yeah, we were in San Fran. That's right, that's right. And then we were just talking. I think we saw a movie that day, or we were yeah. going to see a movie, and then we just ran. It's like, whoa, it's yeah, it was, it was a nice uh, a nice surprise. It was so nice to see you. It's crazy. Out of, like, any place, like, we just randomly saw each other there. So it was really cool. Right. Well, thank okay. you so much for having me on, Paula. I really appreciate it. On next week's episode of Passion Projects, we take another trip down memory lane, and this time I speak to Canadian turn ESPN sports anchor and host of a very engaging podcast, Cinephile, on everything you need to know about movies. Mr. Adnan Burke. Until next time, make sure you keep those dreams alive and maybe turn them into your full-time job or just keep them as your side hustle.